Well, good morning. My name is Kelvin Hicks, and it's my privilege this morning to continue uh, with you in the series that we're engaged in from Paul's first letter to the young Christians at Thessalonica. But first of all, shall we pray together? Father, open our minds and open our hearts to your words this morning. Teach us new truth. Give us a fresh response to things that are familiar and apply your word to our lives by your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, Brian uh, led us into chapter 3. And uh, if I may take the liberty this morning of just picking up on a couple of verses that were part of the passage that Brian was addressing So could we read our passage this morning, but beginning in uh, chapter 3 with verse 2. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you. Verse 5. Timothy was sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, We were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live, since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. It's often said that no news is good news, but that's not necessarily the case. I'm sure that's been your experience too. It can be better to at least know one way or the other because that period of time when you know nothing and you're just waiting to hear the result can become quite a period of anxious anxiety until the news breaks. Well, I suggest that's precisely how Paul was feeling here. Timothy has been away for quite some time, for an extended period, really, revisiting the young Christians in Thessalonica. Paul uh, Paul stayed back in Athens because they figured it was better for him to keep his head down for a while. And so Timothy went on his own. And during the weeks that he was gone, Paul has heard nothing. No email, no text messaging, no mobiles. During the weeks he was gone, nothing has been uh, received. And he is desperate to hear some news. And then suddenly one night, Timothy finds the flat where Paul has been hiding. The basement flat. And he enters the flat, drops onto a chair, totally exhausted. And when he catches his breath, he delivers the critical news in short bursts. They're okay. They're doing fine. They're standing firm. They're showing love and care for one another. And their faith is progressing. And of course, those were just the very issues that Paul was anxious to hear about. 
and he is absolutely delighted. And in verse 6, he refers to it as good news. Well, interestingly, it's the same word that is used there for good news as the word that is used for the good news of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. For sure, Timothy had lots more news to pass on, but I guess it was the following morning before he caught his breath sufficiently to get back up where Paul was and to share the other news with him. But certainly, Paul would have been interested to hear anything that uh, Timothy was able to pass on. Sophia is engaged to Tychicus. Gladys and Philemon have a new baby. John Otheus has won the provincial, a provincial marathon and Stephen has earned second place in the discus. Philip's tent making business is going well. Sales in the past 12 months are 30% up on the previous year. Susan has recently been appointed lead harpist in the municipal orchestra. Just last month, Pamela graduated Bachelor of Cultural Studies from the University of Thessalonica. Jason has just traded in last year's chariot on this year's latest model with an extra wide wheelbase. Peter has just been promoted to production manager of Clay Potts Incorporated. And just last week, Claudia returned from a six weeks OE around the Mediterranean. And Paul would have been intently interested to whatever that personal news might have been at that time. It was almost intriguing news, but in the back of his mind, all the while, was the priority news that Timothy had reported the previous evening. They were growing in their faith and love. This was the crucial news because it targeted the critical issues for Paul. Ever since he left these young Christians some months ago, he had a special concern for them, concerned lest the pressures and the stresses that they faced got them down. Would they hang in? Would their faith survive? Or would they flag it under stress? Chapter 3, verse 5, he says, This is the reason I sent Timothy to find out about your faith, I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and that our efforts might have been useless. But Timothy has just now come to us and brought good news about your faith and love. Lots of newsworthy things have happened to us, haven't they, at ABC Church in recent months? Edmund has bought a house. Stephen has had a significant birthday. Greg and Judy have spent a mystery weekend in Christchurch. Last weekend, I think it was. Lorna has had a great hockey season this year. Tissa left for the United States Tuesday last week to spend some weeks back there with his family. Hel uh, Hayden and Natasha and family had a great skiing holiday recently. Matt and Alex have just about completed, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, just about completed your major renovation uh, on your house. And Jonathan has definitely completed his PhD degree, and we acknowledge this last week. Congratulations, Jonathan. Four years of additional study. The list of newsworthy things goes on and on, and hopefully each of us could fill a page with positive things re relating to our personal lives. And if the Apostle Paul was pastor here at ABC, of course he would consider these sorts of events most important, same as Hayden does. A job promotion, an A or B bursary pass, selection for the first 11, personal sales up on last month, Returned home after two weeks OE in America. But guess what Paul's prime interest would be? How's your faith? How's your love? Is there any good news to report 
on that front. Paul would say the greatest news to hear about someone is the fact that they are advancing in their faith. They are learning God's words and they are living God's ways. Someone who is expressing God's love through their lives. And so he would say to each of us, how's your faith? How's your love? Is there any good news to report there? These are the critical issues. You know what Solomon said? He said everything else is vanity. At the end of the day, everything else will pass away. In other words, it's empty, it's futile, it's short-lived. Rust and decay will set in. Your, your, your carpet will wear thin. You'll hang up your soccer boots. Your Nike gear will go out of fashion. The mags on your wheels will lose their sheen. Someone, perhaps, will succeed you as CEO. And good and all as these things might have been, they haven't really got a future. What's cool this year will be history next year. But your faith and dependence on God's word and your love of his message give you a future. Give us all a future. Way beyond the fads and fashions of this year and last year and next year. Jesus said it will all pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words and your faith in what I say, your faith in my teaching will last forever. So is anything happening with your faith? Is anything happening with my faith? Your love, my love, that could be reported as good news. Timothy brought that sort of good news. And look at Paul's response in verse 8. Now we really live. In other words, our efforts have not been useless. You have given us a new lease on life. Have you ever had a mentor who met, met with you each week? Has there ever been a camp leader who's kept in touch via email after you returned home from camp? Has there been a youth pastor or a Christian friend who's taken time out to follow your interests and to spend time and keep in touch? I can remember this being the experience of our family, a son-in-law of David and Audrey Bird particularly. He would go and watch them play soccer, go and watch them play tennis, and he would keep in touch, following their interested week by week, and they were blessed. Have there ever been grandparents praying for you? One of the greatest joys for any of them would be to hear good news about your growing faith and your selfless love in going the extra mile for others. That's the kind of news that would give them a new lease on life. Because they realize their efforts, their prayers, their concern have not been in vain. You remember what Jesus said? He said, I am come that you might have life. No, he said more than that. He said, I am come that you might have abundant life. And this is what he meant. The unique quality of life that comes as you grow in faith and love. And the joy that this brings to others who have loved you and prayed for you and perhaps even wept for you. One of the most joyous occasions within the life of any church is a baptism. It gives the church a new lease of life. When a young person or an older person says, I want my faith in God and my love of Jesus the Savior to be the prime focus of my life. And I want to share that message by being baptized. That's great news. And that's what can add to the abundant life that Jesus spoke about. Paul said, now we really live. Life is purposeful. Life is rewarding. Life is joyful. Life is abundant for us. Now we really live. 
But he added another thought in verse 8. Now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. I recall the incident I heard of a young woman who buckled under pressure as some years ago now. She failed to stand firm. She went to Totra Springs camp as a teenager, could, could well have been H.M. Rage. She appeared to have accepted the truth about Jesus uh, as a reality in her own life, in her personal way. She attended Nyre Avenue Church for some years. She enrolled in a one-year course at a Bible school. But then as she headed down the career pathway, she became distracted by material things, by social pressures, by family commitments, and trivial pursuits. And they brought their pressure to bear, and she lost her footing in faith and love. She failed to stand firm. And years later, at that time, she was adrift on sinking sand. This was the concern that Paul had for the Christians in Thessalonica. Sure, it was different pressures that they faced. I mean, there was no social media pressure. There was no advertising pressure. But there would still have been family pressures, social pressures, cultural pressures, peer pressures, business pressures, moral pressures. And of course, they faced the pressure of overt persecution. Paul knew that most of these pressures can become tools of the tempter. And as he says in chapter 2, verse 5, and Brian addressed this last week with us too. I was afraid that in one of these ways, the tempter might tempt you and that you would fail to stand firm. Marion and I well remember some years ago when our son Brendan attended the funeral of an 18-year-old school friend from Mount Roskill Grammar. The driver of the car that she was in ran off the road and over a bank. And she was killed. They were both 18 and both drunk. The driver of the car that she was in drove off the road. What a tragedy. I've wondered what pressures, though, she may have felt, she may have been put under throughout that evening before this tragic outcome. Perhaps she was even pressured to go out with this particular group that night. Possibly she was pressured to have an alcoholic drink and then another one. Was she pressured, lured, to get into this car? Instead of standing firm, maybe she was pushed around and she lost the self-determination that she needed to resist the pressures and to stand her ground. Have you ever taken a detour off State Highway, 1, 1, State Highway 1 when you've traveled south to have a look at any of the dams across the Waikato River? Karapiro, Atamuri, Mangakino are just three of them. Massive concrete monoliths standing in a gap across the river, holding firmly to the foundations and to the anchor points of the dam against unbelievable pressure from thousands of tons of water. That's what Paul means here, standing firm in the Lord, verse 8, against the pressure of the tempter, holding securely to the foundations of God's word and claiming the power of his spirit as an anchor to give strength to stand firm against the tempter. It sounds as though that young woman lost her foothold on faith and love because of the pressure to go with the flow, to conform to the norm, to adopt the mindset of social media, to be swayed by the advertising. And then years later, she was drifting in the backwash of life when she could have been out there on the cutting edge of faith, living an abundant life, enjoying the experience of serving others and giving glory to God. 
How firm is your foothold against the pressures of the tempter? How firm is mine? Paul is jubilant. He says, now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord, standing firm under the stress from the tempter. And so what he says in verse 10 comes rather as a surprise. Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. He's just been saying what great news to hear about your faith. And now he's saying we want to come and supply what's lacking in your faith. The word Paul uses here is the same word as the word that would be used for a fisherman bending, uh, uh, um, mending his net uh, that has a, a gash or a tear or a hole in the net. And Paul is saying, I want to help mend the holes in your faith. It's a bit of a corny pun, but there are two kinds of Christians. There are holy Christians H-O-L-E-Y. And there are holy Christians. H-O-L-Y. And Paul says, I want to help mend the holes in your faith and make your faith complete. You are still holy Christians. H-O-L-E-Y. But I want to see you grow and mature into holy Christians. H-O-L-Y. And unblameable well you certainly can't cultivate faith in a two-week intensive course you can crank up your keyboard skills in a one or two week intensive and take your word count from 23 words to 87 words a minute but you don't learn the piano like that you don't become competent in a foreign language like that. You don't learn to drive a car like that. You don't qualify for the Olympics like that. You don't learn to live by faith like that. Paul encourages them. There's no doubt about that. Great news. Standing firm. But there's still a heap to learn. Which will help reduce the holes in your faith. And help make your faith complete. There can be lots of reasons for holes in your faith. It may be because you're a young Christian. And so the holes are the result of uh, immaturity. It may be that your faith is fickle. It may be that you are strongly independent. And faith is most unnatural. With the young Christians at Thessalonica, the gaps in their faith was more because of their immaturity as young Christians. What about you and me? If there's something lacking in your faith or mine, what's the reason for that? Are you a young Christian? Then it may be immaturity. Have you been a Christian for a while? Then it ought not to be immaturity. Perhaps it's fickleness. Perhaps it's faithlessness. Or self-dependence. Or something else. On an occasion, some years ago, in fact, but I clearly recall, I said to Marion, I really don't know if I'm going to manage over these next uh, month or so. I've got a series of lectures to prepare for a new course. I'm chairing the panel and having to write the report for a five-yearly review of another degree. I have a Bible Hour message to think about and prepare. And the first assignment is due in March for the Massey paper that I'm enrolled in. And it's all happening over the next few weeks. And Marian paused for a moment. She said, you need to just have a bit more faith. She can be quite direct <laughs> although I'm reluctant to admit it she was right in some measure I was thinking I don't have the time to cope adequately with that sort of load I was not praying much about it either 
I was not trusting the Lord for inspiration and the ability to manage time to best advantage. These were some things lacking in my faith. And I learned something out of that. Paul said, we want to come and help you learn to fill the gaps in your faith. We want to teach you. We want to encourage you to know the scriptures and to practice praying by day and by night so that your faith is strengthened and becomes constant and more complete. And then Paul breaks into prayer to continue expressing what's on his heart. Verse 22. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. One writer has said this. Genuine Christian love is something that cannot be carried to excess. And that's the essence of Paul's prayer. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow. What I think of here is a spring of water which overflows. Have you ever visited Hamarana Springs at the south end of Lake Rotorua? The water in Hamarana Springs and any natural spring surges up from deep below. And when it reaches the surface, it kind of spills and disperses in all directions. You've seen it too, I'm sure. It doesn't happen by running a hose into the spring. But it happens when the impulse of the water constantly surges up and overflows. And that comes from deep within the heart of the spring. Paul says, may the Lord make that happen to your love. And he's right, you and I can't make that happen. But the Lord can cause that impulse to grow until love for others becomes a natural overflow from your life. Paul says, may it overflow to each other and to everyone else. Some of you remember, uh, may remember that... Um, that uh, secular song from a few years ago. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. And I think even that song meant far more than just sentimental love. I think it meant brotherly love, neighborly love. And Paul's choice of word here spells agape love. Springing up and overflowing to others. May I read an excerpt from a recent um, a devotion that some of you may have read too in Word for Today. It asked the question, so how are you supposed to express your love? And it gave these examples. A son drives for five hours to be with his mother on her birthday. A friend mentions a book that he is interested in and his friend remembers and finds a copy to give him. A middle-aged couple in a restaurant see a young husband and wife with little money and secretly pay their bill. A father knows how much his daughter loves having a clean car and so he sneaks over to wash it for her by surprise. People in a small group email each other throughout the week as a way of expressing their care. A wise man once said, just as the three laws of real estate are location, 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 so the three laws of relationship are observation, observation, observation. The people who give life to us are people who notice us. They know what we love and fear. When we work to truly notice someone else, Love for them grows when we work to truly observe another person. In that self-forgetfulness, our own soul flourishes. May God cause that love to increase, is Paul's prayer. There are people here this morning, people in our church fellowship, for whom love is like a spring of water which overflows. And you can think of some too. 
And this church is blessed and enriched because of them. But Paul is suggesting that that is something that we can all contribute to. It's one thing that can never be carried to excess. Our families, our neighborhoods, our communities, our country desperately need that kind of love. And so Paul says, may that overflow to each other and to everyone else. And finally, Paul prays in verse 13. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. The climate of society that we live in today calls for all kinds of strength. Strength of character, strength of morality, strength of heart. And living blameless, as Paul calls it, means living beyond reproach. That's not living sinless, that's impossible. But living blameless. Dealing with sin in the way that God requires. Confessing it before him. Seeking his cleansing and forgiveness. So that instead of others noticing and picking on the holes in our conduct and character... What they notice is the frank freedom from sin, the frank freedom from the burden of guilt and the joy and abundance that stems from that. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. In recent months, there's been quite a bit of reflection about Queen Elizabeth's visits to New Zealand over an extended period of history. There's also been some speculation about when King Charles may choose to come visit New Zealand. And in chapter 3 and verse 13, Paul is reminding the Thessalonians of another royal visit when Jesus Christ comes back. And he is indicating how they and we can be prepared for that. First of all, having a good news kind of faith that has continued to grow. Secondly, having stood firm against the pressures of the tempter, strengthened in the spirit of the Lord. Thirdly, having increased in love until it overflows like a spring in bringing blessing to others. Fourth, having pursued blamelessness by keeping short accounts in confession before God. And fifth, having favored holiness by being prepared to stand tall and glorify God in a sin-sick society. That's Paul's checklist. A growing faith. A firm standing. A selfless love. Without blame. And practicing holiness. Doesn't it bring a different perspective to life? Being ready for the Lord's coming brings different priorities into focus. And if Paul, Pastor Paul, the Apostle Paul, Pastor, was addressing us this morning, he would be saying, how's your faith? Are you standing firm? Is your love increasing? Are you living blameless? Are you growing in holiness. These are the things that warrant those words of welcome. When Jesus returns on his royal visit, well done, enter into the joy of the Lord. How ready are you? How ready am I for the Lord's return? Sure, I'm a child of the King, but is my faith and my love newsworthy.
Do they warrant those words, good news? And will I hear those words of welcome? Well done. Shall we pray? Father, you were well aware of the stresses and pressures that we face day by day. But we thank you for the resources that you have given us in your word and by your spirit to deepen our understanding of your presence, to strengthen our commitment to your purposes, and to enrich our experience of life here and now as we await the royal visit of Jesus' return in the fullness of time. We confess our weaknesses and our shortcomings, but we thank you for your grace and mercy as we continue to grow in faith, to strengthen our standing, to express a selfless love, avoiding blame, and seeking holiness. Thank you, Father, for your love of each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.